Let us pray for greater willingness to serve God and our fellow men. Father, in the rising of your Son, death gives birth to new life. The sufferings he endured restored hope to a fallen world. Let sin never ensnare us with empty promises of passing joy. Make us one with you always, so that our joy may be holy and our love may give life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Zechariah. Thus says the Lord, Rejoice heartily, O daughter Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter Jerusalem. See, your king shall come to you. A just savior is he meek and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of an ass. He shall banish the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The warrior's bow shall be banished, and he shall proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Verbum Domini from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, 
you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit, if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Consequently, brothers and sisters, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verbum Domini At that time, Jesus exclaimed, I give praise to you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for although you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, you have revealed them to little ones. Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. And you will find rest for yourselves, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Verbum Domini Do you remember the yoke from the farm? the frame of metal or of wood that goes over the necks of two oxen so that both of them can carry the load in the wagon. A yoke is not for one, a yoke is for two. You take the one side, the Lord takes the other. Under the yoke with the Lord, please, do not put your head down into the dust or the mud. 
with that defeated approach to everything, forever licking your own wounds, forever inviting yourself to a pity party, always indulge in that self-pity, which is the first downward spiral into depression. Nip it in the bud. Knock it out of yourself. Under the yoke with the Lord. Don't look too, too far ahead either. If my macular degeneration is this bad in 2005, what's it going to be like in 2010? What you don't see, what you don't know, is that they will have found a cure for macular degeneration by 207, maybe. And there'll be a certain group of us here for sure by 210 who will have entered eternal life in death. Under the yoke with the Lord, please too, do not forever be looking out there on the right, comparing yourself with other people. As I heard one lady express it, of course she was talking about another lady, if she had to live with my spouse, she wouldn't be smiling so much. If you do want to make a few comparisons with other people, Go to the nearest hospital, coronary care unit, intensive care unit, the oncology department, the emergency. And if you can leave that hospital under your own steam, without a wheelchair under your backside, you almost feel like singing according to that beautiful Italian proverb, saluti a tutti, health is everything. It's almost true. Almost. Under the yoke with the Lord. Absolutely the best focus of all is to the left. To the Lord on the cross. Oh, we know he's risen, he's victorious, he is triumphant, he is impassable, he cannot suffer anymore. But you and I do not share completely in that victory of his until our own resurrection on the last day. And we do well to keep the crucified in front of us. That has eternal dimensions because that's God. Sometimes we might question how easy the burden is and how light the load. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, it's always form-fitted, contour-made, just to the size of your back and the strength of your back. You will not be asked by the Lord to carry anything more than you're capable of doing. He asked us to learn from him because he is meek and humble of heart. Meek, kind, gentle, courteous with other people but very humble in adoration, in prostration before him, because he is God, and you and I are not God. That's what it comes down to. He is the creator. You and I are the creatures. He is the great independent one. You and I are the dependent ones. We hang from him. He is the one necessary being. You and I are the contingent beings. We really do not have to have existence. And if he would withdraw his concurring help just for an instant, you and I just wouldn't die. We would all be annihilated without existence. So it makes all the difference in the world whether or not you and I are believers or not. And we do believe. He asks us to cultivate the humble heart because it's only in that kind of heart that can be rooted the graces and helps and supports that he wants to give us. He says, my grace is sufficient for you if your heart truly is humble. And he wants our humility more than he wants our successes. He never did ask us to be successful, did he? Only to be faithful. And the only one who can be faithful 
is the one who cultivates the humble heart. That's the wish of our God. But look at him on the cross. See, that's the story of your sin and my sin. He was reckoned among sinners. He was reckoned a sinner. He became sin. Did you ever hear a stronger expression in the history of the world than that one? Our God became sin. So much would he identify with you and with me, a sinner's. His back lay open where the lash had done its hideous work. Lord Jesus, forgive my unbending pride. His shoulders under the crushing weight of the cross had lost their shape. Lord Jesus, forgive their misuse of my strength. His chest, strained and disjointed, had all but crushed into silence his adorable heart. Lord Jesus, forgive my wayward heart, my sinful lust. His bleeding head, weary with long waking, misshapen by blows, defiled with spittle and discharge, hung in unrecognizable distortion. Lord Jesus, forgive my every sin of sight, of speech, of hearing, of thought. Yes. That's your autobiography and mine with that God-man on the cross. His flesh is the parchment. His blood is the ink. He records exactly everything is atoned for. If you think your burden and your yoke is heavy, with the imposition of what our God would put upon it, be consoled. <laughs> when you buy into sin, it becomes a thousand times heavier, brings you unhappiness and all those people around you unhappiness, and pulls you right into destruction, maybe into even eternal destruction, eventually perhaps even into damnation. If you are burden with the yoke of that concupiscence of the eyes, the greed, the concupiscence of the flesh, lust, and the pride of life, that addiction to your own ego. Take any of the capital sins, pride, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and stuff, and yoke yourselves with them, and you will be crushed sooner or later. Like so many, marriage after marriage after marriage that I hear day in and day out, busted because of pornography. No spouse could ever compete with the images on the internet. Never, ever. This is the devil's number one tool today, without a doubt. Worse than drugs and alcohol. Put that burden on yourself and you destroy your spouse, your children, and all around you. And what a scandal it is to the people of God and everybody else. Then there's another yoke that's rather common. The yoke of anger that some of us put upon ourselves. Let it constantly with a spirit of revenge and hatred and that get even spirit. Self-imposed things that really destroy us. It's like a cancer right in the middle of your heart. It'll destroy you sooner or later. Did you ever meet people like that who are totally angry and never break off from that? It's like a living hell for them and for everybody else that gets to know them. So if your problem is forgiveness and you have already yoked yourself with that burden of anger, I'd ask you to pray with me a little bit. 
I forgive my mother and father for not being perfect, for neglecting me because of their own problems, for not loving me enough. I forgive my brothers and sisters for all the competition, for not helping me when I needed it, for not loving me enough. I forgive my spouse for unreal expectations, for taking me for granted, for not loving me enough. I forgive my son and daughter for not being exactly like me, for learning the hard way, for not loving me enough. I forgive myself for my selfishness, for the stupid things I did in the past, for not loving me enough with legitimate self-love. I forgive God for not making me perfect, <laughs> for not making everyone just like me, for giving me a free will which I often abuse. I forgive anyone who may have physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, financially, or sexually hurt me. I ask God to forgive them as much as he forgives me. And I promise God to try to live faithfully and to create a community of loving people. Don't burden yourself with your own inventions of misery. Now, who is it to whom the Lord shows the Father? It's very clear. Only to those who cultivate his love. Because the degree of our love is the degree of our humility. The degree of our humility is the degree of our happiness. The degree of our happiness is the degree of our gratitude. Only the grateful are happy. Only the humble are grateful. Only the humble are happy. That's an irrefutable syllogism. And we all want to be happy, don't we? There's only one way to be happy, the cultivation of the humble heart. Learn of me because I am meek and humble of heart and you will find rest. You will find peace for your souls. You will find that joy they came to give us and that farewell gift. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give, but not your hearts be troubled. And to cultivate that humble heart, all you have to do is sincerely to pray, to acknowledge God, and to be kind to your neighbor, your spouse, your children, patient, of course, thoughtful. And within yourselves, never for even an instant to give in to that flirting with the people of God called vainglory and vanity. Because to the extent you puff yourself up with that, the Lord will bring you right down to size. Always, without exception, as a proof of his love. And even worse than that, never to give in to that devil of envy. You know that sadness that comes over us at the good fortune of other people? St. Francis would call it a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And if you ever want to cultivate unhappiness, cultivate envy. It will finish you. Envy was the fall of our first parents. Envy brought Satan down. Jesus was delivered up out of envy. It seems to be universal. And I think it is, at least at one time or another in our lives. No matter how old you become or how virtuous you may think you are, it'll hit you sooner or later. Now, how do we pray? Learn the serenity prayer, at least the spirit of it. Because of all these hurts in our life, and they'll pound us to the day we die. Maybe it's because the yoke is the only way to rein in those forces that would really disturb us and just break us up completely. We need a yoke. 
Maybe it's the loneliness of old age, chronic illness, financial insecurity. Your children didn't turn out all that well. There's only one out of the four that's practicing his faith now. You feel like a total failure. That realization can keep us very humble before God, realizing the reality of the expectations of our God. Sickness, suffering, senility, incontinence, Alzheimer's, the nursing home experience, and death itself. They really cut us down to the size to be little, convinced that heaven is still a nursery only for the little ones who become like little children. Yes, Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. What can be changed, what cannot be changed, and there's so much in our lives that cannot be changed. To rebel about against something that cannot be changed is absolute insanity. That's why acceptance is the key to all good mental health. We call it sanity. Acceptance is the key to all good spiritual health. We call that sanctity. So I guess we crystallize it in one little phrase. Lord, it's all right with me. Or, thy will be done, Lord, on earth, in my heart, as it is in heaven, in your heart. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto thine.